St. Schwala, and tonight is the Distinguished Alumni Dinner. It's the biggest fundraiser of the year for St. John's Seminary. It's a chance to honor five alumni of the seminary, five of the great men that this institution has produced over the years. This is our fifth annual Distinguished Alumni Dinner. So we're uh, sold out tonight, and we just expect a great evening with five great honorees. So uh, we also hope to, to uh, set a new record in terms of the funds that are raised for the evening. So uh, we'll see at the end of the evening if that's the case. It was very humbling to be recognized, to uh, realize that the company that I was recognized with was, was, like I say, very humbling. The Cardinal was honored and uh, other great priests, uh, several of which taught me in the seminary and uh, for whom I had the highest regard. Uh, this year, Tim Dyer is uh, one of my heroes. I think he had one of the toughest jobs in the Archdiocese and bore it very well with, with great honor and great integrity. And uh, I'm, I'm just proud to know him. And uh, Jerry McCarthy is a classmate of mine. And uh, again, I have the highest regard for Jerry and, and the other recipients. It's uh, very special and it's great to be back. Great to be honored to This is the uh, annual seminary Distinguished Alumni Dinner. And it's a, a good way of honoring our um, distinguished alumni, both ordained and sometimes bishops, cardinals, as well as uh, lay men who uh, were seminarians here and have uh, gone on to distinguish themselves in different walks of life. I, I have very fond memories of St. John's here. I was ordained in 1968, so those were rather exciting years during the Second Vatican Council that uh, uh, I was studying theology here, and it was a really, really great formation that I know under Monsignor Cox is continuing to be a great um, formation for the upcoming generation of priests. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving and generous God, we give you thanks and praise for St. John's Seminary as it approaches its 75th anniversary, and for the many years of forming priests to serve the Church. For the faculty and staff and students who have walked these halls over those years, being formed in the teachings and the spirit of the Church, and the reform and renewal of the Second Vatican Council as we're mindful of its approaching 50th anniversary. For the current seminarians, that they may truly open their hearts to the spirit and the discernment and formation that is their opportunity during their days here. And especially for the distinguished alumni being honored this evening, for their years of service and commitment to the gospel message, sharing that message within the church and to the larger community. As we enter this year of faith, we ask your blessing on all of us gathered here this evening, strengthened by the food we share tonight and by the nourishment of the Eucharist, may we continue to open ourselves to the gift of your spirit. Bless this food and bless us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And uh, the salads will be brought up in a moment, but I would like at this time to acknowledge the presence of a number of those who have received the Distinguished Alumni Award since its inauguration five years ago. So uh, I think I have seen everyone who is here, but I would like, as I call your name, for you to stand and remain standing until we have acknowledged them all. Cardinal Roger Mahoney, Monsignor Ron Sweat, Monsignor Lloyd Torgerson, Monsignor Royal Vatican, Father Michael McCullough, and Mr. Christopher Redondo, and Monsignor John Hughes, if he made it. If you would stand, God bless you. Pope John Paul II talks about the priest as being a bridge and not an obstacle. About being a person who can dialogue and enter into relationships easily. Jerry embodies that. 
Pope John Paul II also says that a priest needs to be an expert in humanity. And having journeyed with Jerry for many, many years, we've just celebrated our 40th anniversary of ordination. I know that he is an expert in humanity. He's surrounded by his dad, four of his sisters come from Texas. He cares deeply for them. He's very solicitous of people in need. Jerry, for me, models how the human person can be such an agent of God's grace by the power that God gives us. Not only that, one final comment. Jerry has been discerning the needs of the church for good, healthy, balanced, holy leaders for decades. And he has also been very involved in addressing the needs of priestly formation nationwide through his association with the Association of Theological Schools, which is very involved in the accreditation process of our seminaries, and now currently as the executive director of the National Catholic Educational Association Seminary Department. And so, tonight, as as distinguished alumnus, we welcome Monsignor Jeremiah McCarthy back to St. John's, where he was formed and where for many years he ably served as professor of moral theology, academic dean, and rector. Jerry, congratulations. <laughs> to live up to. Uh, uh, Jack, thank you for that extraordinarily gracious and overly generous uh, uh, introduction. You know, when you come up uh, on an occasion like this, you are reminded uh, how powerful you are surrounded by uh, great examples of love. Um, I'm happy to be in the company of Jack and my good friend Ed Clark, who's here. And we know that uh, we come to the priesthood because of the love and the great example in our families. <clears throat> my uh, dad, who's here tonight, uh, we have, my mother died in 1991. And the epitaph that uh, he put in the cemetery to honor her, uh, my mother Margaret, she saw God in each one of us. And Dad, I think that's true of you too. You saw God in each one of us. And uh, every vocation comes from great love. I think I come to the priesthood because I saw in my mother and father uh, great examples of sacrifice and love. Every vocation to the priesthood, to the religious life, to married life, to single life, uh, comes because we have been blessed by great examples of love. And so it's with a grateful heart tonight that I'm here tonight, and I just am very humbled by uh, the honor. It's thoroughly undeserved, and uh, many, many others are richly uh, deserving of this uh, claim. But let's uh, be grateful tonight for wonderful friends, uh, for great priestly friends, for the opportunity to be servants and people who love one another, and for all of the seminarians, thank you for your generosity, for your willingness to say yes, for your willingness to be instruments of grace and love for God's people. So thank you, and thank you all. I would like to uh, now ask Monsignor Jim Forson, who is the Vocation Director of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, to come forward to introduce the next of our distinguished alumni. 
Good evening, everyone. I've been given the honor to introduce Monsignor Tim Dyer to you all. Even though I lived in the same rectory with Monsignor Dyer, long enough to know that he loves being called Monsignor. <laughs> and I know a plethora of stories about him. I thought it best that you not listen to me, but rather to the people of St. Columkills and Nativity, the two communities where he has lived and worked for the better part of 18 years. So for the past month during Mass, having explained this event to them and my role in giving the introduction, I invited the people in the pews to tell me what they would say if they were giving the introduction. And I wrote down their responses. So instead of listening to me, I invite you to listen to his parishioners. Beatrice told me, he has the true spirit of God in his heart. He is very humble. He's a good listener. Young teenage girl told me, there was a time I was in the youth group and he was in charge and I was going through a rough time in my life and he was so patient with me and understanding. I wish there were more priests like Father Tim. Isabella, age 15, said, he has a heart of gold and deep compassion for people. Brianna, one of our young servers, said, He's so nice, he never gets mad. <laughs> she doesn't know him. <laughs> Julie says, he's funny. I love the way he says masses. Sister Carolyn, a sister who has been, a religious been in the parish for years, said, he chose to be here. He loves the community. One woman told me about how gracious and compassionate was the care he extended to her mother who suffered and died from Alzheimer's. The nine o'clock choir told me about how grateful he was in acknowledging the Garifuna com community from Belize. Countless Latinos told me he loves Latinos. Innumerable African Americans told me he knows our history as well as we do. And for Maria, loyal. And Natalie, what can you say about a man who walks on water? <laughs> And Stephanie said, he means the world to me. And Iris said, he's down to earth. And Chester said, a great man who cares for people. And Chris, our Jesuit seminarian, said, Tim taught me that a priest is a servant. And Gloria said, his eyes sparkle even when he's telling fibs. <laughs> And little Irma said, during a ward ceremony in the church, when I was so little I couldn't see what was happening, he stood me on the pews so I could see, but he told me not to tell anyone or else he would get in trouble for scratching up the pews. <laughs> you know, parishioners often refer and call their pastor, my pastor. Priests don't. Parochial vicars or associates in parishes or men in residence, we usually say the pastor or a pastor. We don't say my pastor. Well, I've worked for seven pastors, and I lived with Tim Dyer for eight years. That's a rarity among priests to be so long in the same rectory. And I can tell you, Tim Dyer is the finest pastor I have ever met. Tim Dyer is my pastor. Tim. Jim, thank you. That was very touching and very kind. Um, my classmates are here. I don't think they know who you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Senior Cox called me last December to advise me of this award. And I was surprised, and I thanked him. And when we hung up the phone, I went to look up a passage in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, where Jesus is talking about the condition of servants. And basically he says, you know, at the end of a long day, after hard work, a servant comes home, and nobody makes a big deal out of it. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, and that's the way it's supposed to be with you. After you've done all you've been commanded to do, simply say, we are unworthy servants. We did what we were told to do. I've been meditating on that all this year. Along the way, 
I have recounted all my many blessings from God. They began with my parents. Um, they filled the house with faith every day. Every night, we could hear them praying the rosary in their room. There was a copy of The Imitation of Christ next to my dad's chair in the living room. My mother had a wonderful laugh, and my father had a great sense of humor. So there was great complementarity and security in our home. The most important blessing they gave me when I was 10 years old was my little sister. And four years after that, I went to the minor seminary. And there, the church blessed me with all the brothers I had never had at home. <laughs> many years later, many of them would be priests, and I would be asked to be in full-time ministry to priests for five years. I will not try to claim that the priests, while I was vicar of clergy, thought that I was the greatest blessing to them. <laughs> but it was the most important honor I've ever received since ordination. Through the years, I have had the blessing of working with a good number of women religious who are very close to me and I to them. And they have shown me a simplicity of lifestyle and the dedication that I've never attained. And I have had family and friends who have become my family who have been the Martha and Mary Lazarus in my life. Hospitality has been given to me in kindness. But the blessing for which I'm being distinguished tonight is that of being a parish priest. And most of my years I've spent in either East LA or South Central LA. So I've run into a very common misconception. People will come up to me and say, you're in the inner city? Wow. And behind the remark, I think, is the implication that they think the inner city is so dangerous that there are bullets flying all the time. But some of them, I think, are implying that there is something heroic about my being there. There's nothing heroic about my being there. But I do live with some heroic people. I have never lacked for spiritual directors among my parishioners in all the years I've been there. They have shown me things that I never knew, never understood. I have never suffered discrimination. I have never been the object of racial prejudice. I have never stood eight to ten hours in line in a medical clinic only to receive inadequate health care. I've certainly never been a single mother whose husband leaves her when their third child is diagnosed with autism. My parishioners inspire me. And I realize very clearly that the final blessing going to heaven is not something I can take for granted. Hangs in the balance. The fact that I'm in the inner city does not mean that I live like our people. I live there. I don't live like the people. I have a beautiful room in the rectory. I have a car and a gas card available to me. I have full health coverage. I have a woman who cooks my meals and does my laundry. I walk down any street in the parish and people address me with titles of respect. I have complete health care. And all my life I've had great opportunities for education, most importantly here at St. John's. Most of my parishioners have not had most of those opportunities. They get up in the morning early, and they get on buses, and they go across town, and they clean our houses. They pedal through the city streets on their bicycles to the places where they wash our dishes and wash our cars. They sit behind industrial sewing machines in the garment district. They pick our fruit. They nanny our children. And when our parents get old, they come into our homes and work long hours trying to take care of Alzheimer's patients with great tenderness and care. And after long hours, all of them go home at night, and nobody makes a big deal out of it. I know that it is, for me, important to make friends with the poor. Because after all, the kingdom of heaven is going to belong to them. And I think my greatest joy in heaven will be to see Jesus' teaching realized that the last shall be first. On my own, I don't think I'm going to get in. 
I mean, even Craig, if I were to take this wonderful gift you're giving me and go up to St. Peter at the gates and say, <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't as distinguished as one night. That's ticket to heaven right there. <laughs> if I pulled out my title and said, and of course, you know, I am a Monsignor. <laughs> I don't think that would cut it with St. Peter. My hope is that the Lord in his goodness will inspire my parishioners to look back once the line forms in front of the gates and see me and reach back and put me in with them. To you seminarians, I would say, prepare to be parish priests. Love your people and you will be rewarded with treasures beyond your imagining. A ustedes, que vinieron, muchísimas gracias. Les quiero mucho, ya saben. Monsignor Cox, thanks very much. To all of you, thank you very much.